Hi everyone, welcome to week five. This is the uh, last week of, uh, of our first module, thematic module. And if, um, if to recap a little bit very generally, in the first module, we were talking about revolutionaries and the idea of revolutionaries really had to do because not only as a transnational actor and a network, it really shows the whole panoply of the actors when it comes to social change. And really much of what we're talking about this unit is different global changes that, that occur at different transnational levels, right? So the revolutionary uh, theme allow us to think through those global changes from a very holistic perspective, right? Then we went into one specific aspect of the new techno elites or really, really the elites more specifically. And we dwelled into how that came about, how the functions, the systems that allows it, um, and, and the particularities of our techno, so-called techno-feudal uh, society, different actors and networks within that. And in the last part of the module, we're gonna go into something that could be called the neoliberal subject or the global neoliberal subject. And we're doing, doing it through uh, this, the great film, Parasite, um, the Korean great, great film, uh, Parasite. And when we're thinking about neoliberal subjects, we're really thinking about, um, it could be another word for citizens or global citizens. So when we think about citizenry from a global perspective, um, I think Parasite, um, as one of the articles suggested, um, is a parable, but perhaps, perhaps in a different way um, as the article is arguing, in my opinion, I look at Parasite um, as a parable of, uh, in, in the sense that it teaches us uh, a lesson um, that is very much global. And this is why I chose uh, this film, uh, because the film before, for instance, the Squid Game was a hit in Netflix, uh, it was, a major um, climax for, for Korean film at the global scale, scale winning uh, the Palme d'Or in Cannes and the Oscars in 2020. Um, and the idea that it, that it became global uh, had to do not so, not only, I guess, not only because it reached a global audience through this, um, to the Oscars, to Cannes, through through the film distribution uh, circle, but because it connected with audiences through a global narrative, and this global narrative has to do with how global capitalism affects at all affects us all in very similar ways and how audiences can relate very easily to what's happening in the film, to the class divide in the film. And, and then the idea of parable here is pointing at how this narrative can be think, can be thought as, as a type of religion, as a type of faith, as, as capitalism, uh, can be thought in, in, in this way as a type of religion. Now, um, if we connect this to the idea of the neoliberal subject, uh, we have to first think of neoliberalism as a stage within capitalist history and not so much as a com consensus, as a common sense, or even as an ideology. As a, at least not as a coherent ideology. In, in that sense, I think the idea of capitalism or even neoliberalism as a religion is useful to a certain extent. It's useful because it is showing how an ideology is imposed, how a, a, a specific type of faith is imposed on 
these global subjects, these global neoliberal subjects. Now, the constructions of this neoliberal subject of this citizenship under uh, citizenship uh, slash worker under capitalism um, is not so much uh, created internally that it that is in the sense that these subjects are believing the religion of capitalism, even though they may be believing the religion of capitalism eventually. But these subjects are constructed through imposition. They're directly imposed. It's a directly imposed religion, very much like Catholicism was in, was imposed in throughout the um, what today is Latin America, right? So that's the way that's that's the angle I'm coming from, and I'm following really here Annie McLahan's critique of how most of the um, Cultural, most of the theories, uh, they tend to be cultural theories, at least all political theories uh, of neoliberal, neoliberalism have thought of the neoliberal capitalist stage as a discourse that creates a consensus, that creates a hegemony in, in whereby the global neoliberal subjects, i.e. citizens slash workers, uh, accept indirectly, implicitly, without knowing sometimes, this so-called religion. Um, and I'm using here religion because at, almost as a shorthand, I think because it's very useful and it, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting metaphor from which we can approach uh, economic and political issues. And also because um, within the film, uh, there are, uh, multiple acts of faith, and I will be explaining explaining that. And faith here, uh, it's extremely important, right? Now, the caveat that I'm introducing is precisely this second point right here, right? That this religion is not believed. There is there is not a not so much believed, or at least the most important part of this religion uh, is not that it's belief, but that there is in post, and especially through violence, right? And then an example here, we can think in the Kims, the, the poor family here at the top of the screen, and the Parks, the family that lives in, in this house at the, at the bottom of the, uh, in the, the picture, right? As, as who's drawing the line uh, when it comes to thinking about life uh, and when I say drawing the line, who has agency, right? To think about their lives in this economized, hyper utilitarian, neoliberal way. I, how is it that life for these two different families becomes commodified? And if you think about the parks, uh, they understand, and I'm emphasizing here, understand in the sense that there is an agency involved in here. When you're understanding, you're learning, you are involved in your own understanding. Their life through this commodification lens, right? Everything is a transaction. Everything can be bought and sold. Uh, their lives uh, in, in the, in, are, are, are all revolves around this commodification of goods and services, and especially externalizations of goods and services. And they understand that life, and they not only have bought into it, they don't, they, it's become common sense. It's become so normative that it's simply not questioned, right? Their position is not questioned. Um, now, the Keynes is not that they understand their life through this economized neoliberal commodified way is that they have no other option but to accept that type of ideology. That it's simply unthinkable that they could not take uh, an opportunity like that to basically get into the park's house and make their lives significantly better, right? There is no option there. So in this sense, violence is very much at the core of the way neo neoliberalism works, 
right? Or this capitalist religion works. I remember I'm thinking here about when I say capitalism, I'm referring really to neoliberalism, but the other way around, but in this in the historical sense, because I don't want to be it's basically shorthand. When I say capitalism, I'm talking about um late capitalism or what is called also neoliberal capitalism, it's been also called post-capitalism. I'm talking about in terms of uh historical stages. Okay, so uh, that's why I'm using it um, almost interchangeably. So, uh, so, so I don't have to be repeating myself constantly, right? So whenever I use uh, capitalism in a much more specific way, uh, I will let you know. But in, in, in this case, capitalism I'm, 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 and neoliberalism, the way I'm using it now, is historical and it refers to the latest part of, 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 of of capitalism uh, roughly between 1980 and 2008. Uh, that is 2008. So basically the GFC, I think is, as I think I preferred before, is that, um, uh, uh, is that, that, that border where um, perhaps capitalism as we know it, it's basically ending. Uh, and this is obviously, it's simply a theory. There's no way to know that. Because we need time for that, yeah. But but parasite is really interesting precisely because of that, right? Because it's teaching us a lesson about this religion of capitalism, this type of faith that we have. But this faith works in two different ways, right? For the for the kings, the poor family is imposed through violence. Uh, it's accepted simply because there is no other alternative. For the parts, it's a question of consensus. It's understood as uh, way of living, right? Um, so that's why we need to go, and I, I like to to um, to compare these two passages from these two different um, uh, articles uh, that that um, that you're, you were supposed to read, or that you at least can read. Um, and in in the first one, uh, we means you know. Uh, is talking about how capitalism has recreated the way humans understand their, their existence and see how uh, we're talking about humans and not specifying what type of humans, but humans, there is a universal um, and uh, aspiration when it comes in, when theorists of neoliberalism understand how the neoliberal consensus is reached. So we talk about humans understand their existence. Uh, and purpose is based on the fetishiz fetishization of material culture, money, that i.e. commodification, right? And the greater power given to those who own more of this type of capitals. So the priests of, of this religion are those at the top, then the believers are at the bottom, right? In this respect, the Kim family in Parasite abides by a different category of religion, that of capitalism, when they justify and ground their behavior in the name of making a living, that's it, in the name of money. So they're justifying their behavior because they believe in capitalism. Their plot is not actually a crime in the logic of capitalism, where money is ultimate, even a moral goal. Now, this has to be, um, I, I would really put a pin on this and, and, and start thinking to what extent, like I was saying before, to what extent they can actually believe in something that is imposed. Uh, to what extent um, they simply have crime as an alternative, as use crime as an alternative, as a as basically one of the few alternatives that you have to um, to achieve a certain type of social mobility in a context when humanity, people, these global citizens are constantly told that they can aspire, that they should aspire to much more than what they currently have in this logic of capitalism, right? So I think that is, if you put a pin on that, then think uh, of that and leave it there for a second and then compare that to what McClanahan is saying, right? So uh, so instead of that, of this, um, the Kim family as parasites that buy into the religion of capitalism, Maybe we should be thinking about them as a surplus population. 
the, surpl the surplus popula population, and I quote now, that capital seeks to contain, not to credit, seeks to contain, not to credit. That is, they seek to contain this type of population, put them in these ghettos, and not to just give them credit, give them debt, and make them prosper through debt, right? Not to export, that is to, that is to push them outside the margins, not so much to exploit, to annihilate, not to invest, to destroy and not to invest. They're not, they're not adding any type of value in the logic of, in our current logic of capitalism. Far from being controlled by what Brown, and this is Wendy Brown, uh, terms soft power, these surplus subjects are managed and disciplined with violence little concern with the likelihood of their destruction from the segregation of basic services like housing and healthcare to police violence and prison, right? So if you think about the Kims and the different type of indirect violence that they're enduring, you know, that basically uh, the unsanitary conditions that they live in, their housing situation, then the, uh, living almost um, in, in, in without the day of light, and eventually uh, we will see how that uh, that is an actual possibility uh, that you just not live in a semi basement, but you just live in a in a bunker in a basement without uh, without without seeing the day of light. How that type of um, destructive logic is meant to finally annihilate this type of people, not to make them believe, not to invest in their belief in to of not it's not meant to keep keeping them as members of this religion, right? Uh, it's um, the argument here following Wakand uh, is to achieve the brute neutralization, road retribution, and simple warehousing. You just are warehousing these people because they are so expendable that at a certain point, uh, the system is better off without them, without them existing. And here is, this is in contrast to what Noah is saying in here, in the first, in, in the, in the first paragraph. Um, the consensus is not such a consensus as um, as a question. It's not so much a question of consensus, but a question of violence. Yeah, and and the different type of violence that we will be analyzing in the film revolves around that about the idea that all these parasites, or so-called parasites, because as we will say, it's a little bit more complicated. They are not buying into any type into a, a, a capitalist religion. They are not neo neoliberal subjects that have economized their lives, that are the um, entrepreneurs of their own lives. They're expendable. They're an expendable population. They're a surplus population that needs to be contained, needs to be exported, pushed outside, expulsed. And ultimately, uh, the, the system would do much better without them existing. Now, this leads us to another question, which is um, it, within that logic, violent logics, who are really the parasites in the film, right? And before we get into who are the real parasites, and it's important to think that uh, the term parasite is a term that it's, I think we understand it in two ways. And mainly we think of parasites as a product of biology, but really as Noah is explaining, uh, it, it has a political cultural origin that goes all the way to the 19th century. So the police, so it's not that parasites so the idea of, of parasitic relationships start off and for a very long time is only a question of politics. That is, it's a question of hierarchy and prestige uh, between two different groups. 
and then uh, and this lasts all the way to the 19th century. So the original um, term comes from parasitos in, in Greek, and, and, and now a quote, it has to do with something or someone beside the grain, and it was used in the fifth century before um, BCE to refer to the temple assistants in, the, in Greek religion who lived on the grain. Then this evolves and it became uh, a name for the comedic stock character of the collapse, the flatterer in Greek and Latin comedy, who solicits free lunches with his wit. It's not until the 19th century that we start looking at parasites in the biological uh, sphere, right? So then when we think about parasitic relationship, we need to think who is on the top and who is at the bottom and who is um, labeling, uh, labeling the relationship as parasitic, i.e. so who is really benefiting, who is the host and who is the parasite? Uh, and that relationship is not so clear cut is um, because in the end, when we think about who's the host and who's the parasite in this parasitic relationship, we need to uh, we need to think that what is what is what that the the given uh, sorry what that what the given gives is worthless. That is that the parasite the the very little um, uh, usage that we can have from the parasite is basically useless that for instance in the in the here in the example of the of the collax character there's the flutterer right in this comedy uh, the wit the jokes the entertainment that uh, that the collax gives and provides uh, is rendered worthless and what is what has value is the lunch that he, that he or she receives, that the collapse receives, right? So in this sense, we are putting the, the parasite and the host in this hierarchical position. And, and that's why our current usage of parasite and parasitic relationships, uh, not so much, I'm here I'm not speaking, I'm not entering the realm of science, I'm not entering the realm of culture and the way we use it, uh, the point is that the way we use it has much more to do with the political and cultural etymology of the word parasite than with the actual biological term, right? And we cannot really escape the political implication of this term, right? So then you're thinking, who are the parasites? Then we need to think, um, who's bringing in the, in the film? Who's bringing, who's bringing value? Who's adding value to society? And... It, it, it's um, really interesting to, to, to look at the different type of jobs that the kings and the parks have, right? Um, and then through thinking uh, the different values that they're bringing, we have to think about the, the way we conceive our current capitalist structure uh, also as parasitic, in certain in certain aspects, right? How we can uh, and and when I'm using now parasitic, I'm using it in a much more much more loosely way. Right? I'm not exactly talking about a host and a parasite, but parasitic in a much broader term, in the sense that there are those who bring value, money, and deserves to be at the top, and there's those in society who do not bring as much value, that do not uh, create as much wealth, that therefore, therefore, and I'm putting in quotation mark the concession here, therefore, uh, have much less because they're not bringing as much, as much value as those at the top and then they belong at the bottom. That meritocracy or the myth of meritocracy, it's um, the ideology that justify that those at the top stay at the top and those at the bottom stay at the bottom, right? Um, so in this sense, if I think it, it's, it's worth looking at what Nathan Park does versus what the King family do, right? While Nathan Park works in this hybrid mod, module map and 
and the the title of his company, another brick, also which is a, a reference to Pink Floyd's um, "Another Brick in the Wall," which is like uh, an anti-capitalist song, basically. Um, this it's it's the title of of the company and the and the title of his job is consciously vague and abstract precisely because of that because he's um he's siding with these techno feudal lords that we talked about last week he's that part is that new elite uh whose job is basically almost to pinpoint um it's so ethereal uh albeit it brings so much status. It, it, it gets so much, uh, it accumulates so much wealth, right? But it doesn't seem to bring that much value. Now, on the other hand, the Kim family, um, the Kim family have material type of jobs. And before I say a word about the type of jobs, I think it's worth um, looking at what the late David Graeber, an anthropologist, uh, the anthrop anthropologist um, um, uh, of social relations, uh, um, thought of as the uh, bullshit uh, bullshit jobs theory or a theory in bullshit jobs, and he talked about bull and slash shit jobs. So he's distinguishing from bullshit jobs and shit jobs. And it's worth uh, listening to him. And then I'll say a little bit more about the King family. Bullshit jobs I define as a job where even the person doing the job secretly believes the job really shouldn't exist. But nonetheless, a part of the conditions of employment is that you have to pretend that it does. It's important to distinguish between bullshit jobs and shit jobs. Um, mostly when you say bullshit jobs, people at first assume you mean jobs that just you don't really want to have. Jobs where they don't treat you well, jobs where they don't pay you well, jobs where you work under difficult or humiliating or onerous conditions. And most of the jobs that are shit jobs actually aren't bullshit jobs. Most of the jobs that um, oppress you are jobs like you know, cleaners or ditch diggers or, or nurses. Uh, servants of various kinds um, who are mistreated, at least know they're doing something. A bullshit job is actually kind of the opposite of that. A bullshit job, you're often given a lot of money, you're treated very well, with a great deal of respect, and um, often seen as you know the, the person in your family who most made something of yourself. But at the same time, you're secretly haunted by the knowledge that you're not actually doing anything, that if your job didn't exist at all, the world either would change in no way, or even might become a slightly better place. This is one of the great mysteries of our time, as far as I'm concerned, because we usually associate make work, stupid made up jobs with sort of state socialism. You know, in the Soviet Union, they used to say, well, you know, we pretend to work and they pretend to pay us. They make up jobs which are completely unnecessary. That makes sense because they had an ideology of full employment. On the other hand, capitalism, that's exactly the thing that isn't supposed to happen. A private firm would never hire someone and put out good money to someone who they don't actually need. But in fact, if you talk to people who work for large corporations, they do it all the time. How does that happen? I think part of it has to be explained by political pressure. In a, in a way, just as in the Soviet Union, there was a central directive saying, we need full employment. They didn't say, therefore, make up bullshit jobs, right? Uh, but they didn't say, don't do it. Uh, in a similar way, uh, we have pressure from both the left and the right to create jobs all the time. You know, on the one hand, you have the left saying we need like public works, we need more um, money being given to consumers to stimulate the economy. On the right, they're saying give money to capitalists and they'll hire people. But this, the one thing left and right totally agree on is the solution to all problems is more jobs. But they never say jobs that actually do something. You know, jobs that are worthwhile anyway. It's just assumed that if jobs are created, they will necessarily serve a purpose. And if you don't specify that, if you don't have a self-conscious policy of trying to make sure the jobs actually do something, you're going to end up with useless make work. It's just going to happen. A lot of 
bosses, people who hire people, just get very angry at this, at me about this. They're about the only people that get angry at this premise. They say, look, you know, I would never hire someone if they didn't serve a purpose. This is just stupid, insulting, you don't understand how capitalism works. But bosses are the last people to know what's really going on. I trust people to understand what they're really doing, or at least if anybody does, they will. So here, one of the, the differences between the bullshit job that um, Nathan Park has and the shed jobs that the King family had. One of the obvious uh, differences is that Nathan Park really doesn't do anything. That if his job disappears, um, by hinted by his very abstract, ethereal title, almost immaterial, liquid title, uh, society will run the same, run his course, nothing is not essential. But the King family, in everything they do, they're essential workers. They're essential workers. They're, they're, their job are absolutely material and essential for society to run. Now, the difference is that what a bullshit job uh, is doing is, and uh, is really, especially at the very top, what it's doing, and there's different degrees of this, what it's really doing is extracting value. And Clary Matei, it's uh, an economics professor in new school and Robert Brennan, I think, it's, uh, which is also in the new school. They talk about this um, when they talk about the financialization of, of, of the economy. The financialization of the economy, the problem is not so much that they're creating this um, value for the ones at the top, is that they're, ex they're only extracting an accumulating value uh, uh, ever so fastly uh, on, on, on a greater and greater pace. While the jobs that the type of, that the King family have and different degrees of Kings, if you think about jobs that are essential for society to run uh, from you know, someone who sells something to someone who cleans the street or a teacher or a nurse, those jobs stop uh, uh, having value because all the value are, is at the top. They, they are not as valuable for in this spiral of capitalism, right? So this is what's really happening here. Um, so in this sense, there's this liquid hegemony and liquid in, this, in the sense that the parks uh, in, in, in global capitalism uh, have an hegemony based uh, uh, on uh, on an immaterial. It's it has an immaterial basis. It doesn't have a, any type of productive value. It only has extractive uh, value. Therefore, accumulation. If you compare that to the other parasites, uh, not only they are now extracted of all the value, they are labeled as unworthy of value. Therefore, they're smelly uh, and they're not allowed to cross lines. And remember that Nathan Park says that a lot of times, he is good because he doesn't cross the line. He's about to cross it, but he never crosses it. Their jobs are shit, right? And so are their lives because all their value, almost all the value is being extracted and accumulated at the top. While those at the top uh, justify their own ex existence through this liquid hegemony, through the creation of these bullshit jobs in different degrees from uh, CEOs to venture capitalists to uh, different type of man managerial, uh, uh, managerial jobs, right? And, and, and this is for uh, not, not so much a fault of, of their own, it is the logic, the logic of neoliberalism that is creating this. Uh, the logic of a system that was created, especially after the 80s, to simply extract and accumulate is a, is a logical end to the system we live in, right? Um, now, the problem that we all are having at, and as, uh, as global neoliberal subjects, uh, whether we are at the top or we are at the bottom or we're somewhere in between, uh, is that everything seems to be 
is sprawling out of control and nearing uh, the final stage uh, of this era. We don't know what's coming next, uh, but we all feel that this is coming to an end, that our current capitalist, capitalist structure is coming to a, some type of end. Um, and parasites, um, if we look at the end of parasite and the idea of respect, and I'm using respect here in quotation mark as one of the quotes from one of the characters, uh, we will see the irony in, in how the end of the movie mirrors the end of capitalism. Um, and this irony has to do because when we think of respect, immediately we're thinking of the respect that someone from the bottom demands from someone at the top, that the kings would demand from the parks. But in reality, uh, respect uh, is demanding from at, at a horizontal level. Uh, the demands for respect is simply uh, a demand to stay the same, uh, the a demand for recognition. Um, and that idea of respect in the sense of respect equals recognize that I haven't crossed the line and that's why it's ironic. Uh, because when you think in, uh, about someone demanding respect, you think about someone in stepping uh, over the line and metaphorically, you know, shaking that uh, those those at the other side of the line, demanding the respect and then getting back to the line once that respect is gained. But in here, the respect is demanded without ever crossing the line metaphorically. Um, so what respect is doing here is simply establishing that these hierarchies, that these lines within the capitalist structure are not trespassed. That, um, and, and it's, well, contrary to what we could think, um, it's a demand for the here, that the lines to be recognized, to be stabilized and, and, and to be respected for the lines to be respected, the lines between classes, I'm saying here, to be respected, contrary to what we could think. Um, so I'm gonna play a little uh, very telling explanatory clip about this, and then we'll start um, thinking about uh, something that is probably one of the key questions that we need to ask, who is, the, uh, who is the subject here? And when it comes to imposing, respecting these lines. For the ultimate example, remember how Gunse got all that blood on his face doing an extreme version of his daily routine, which involves beating his head against the wall to turn on the lights for Mr. Park. The rich patriarch, who has no role in the upkeep of his own household, has always assumed that the lamps are activated by motion sensor. The manual labor required to make Mr. Park's life so comfortable is invisible to him. Now the ugly underbelly of the system is finally rising up, and the Parks don't see it coming until it's too late. The party's warrior theme may be one reason that no one even glances at Gunse when he first walks out on the lawn. The blood on his face happens to resemble war paint. He instinctively makes a beeline to Ji Jung, seeking to exact revenge on the Kim family for locking him up and killing his wife. This is a culmination of one of the most tragic aspects of class conflict and parasite, the lack of solidarity among members of the working poor. Parasite, of course, looks at class warfare, but it's not always as clean cut as just poor versus rich. In fact, some of the film's most brutal scenes show working class people fighting each other tooth and nail. See, so in here, the subject, when it comes to enforcing line, the subject is clearly the parks, the violence that they are able to exercise indirectly without getting their hands uh, dirty by simply expelling these people from the wages that, that they, can, they can give. 
um, by expelling them from from work um, simply because um, and, and think if you think through the the reasons uh, of why these people are expelled, um, it, it they're meant to be um, irrational reasons. Um, there is uh, and and they're meant to represent the complete instability of these uh, surplus lives of these um, uh, precarious lives that are expendable um, and. And and then, and a smell triggers smell as a metaphor of crossing the line because uh, uh, a smell is the smell is uncontrollable and the smell that the parks um, uh, can smell uh, is uh, it's completely out of the control uh, of the king's family. Uh, this but this smell is crossing the line in this metaphorical way. And the outcome uh, is the demise of the kings. The the kings. Uh, there is always the fear to uh, fall lower in the hierarchy, um, and, and that it doesn't really um, affect the park as much as affects the kings. Um, in in that sense, uh, parasite is really imposing this neo-feudalist system, uh, which is the uh, very last stage of um, capitalism in, in which we have this new speak, um, this very um, new speak is, you know, the Orwellian term for, for, for words that uh, hide their true meaning. When we think about free market, um, uh, free market capitalist system is anything but free. Uh, when we start thinking who's free in that free market, who has, free, who has freedom of movement, who has freedom of, uh, um, of options, of choices, right? And who can actually has faith in these markets, um, who have true faith in, in these market, this markets, um, obviously those who benefit from the markets versus who is forced to have faith in the market because there is simply no other option. Right? Who's imposing the faith in this in this case? The the type um, uh, the type of elites that the park represents in the in the, in the film. Right? So, parasite uh, strikingly exemplifies um, this new feudalist system in two different ways. In one way is the promise of getting out of the social pecking order that they that the kings are and the fear of falling even lower in that social pecking order um, and the violence and, and that promise then has another side of the coin which is the violence it generates um, and this and this violence is between classes but these classes uh, are connected as well as they're unconnected in the very much in the class divide that, that exists, in the class kissing that exists between the parks and the kings uh, as a metaphor of the class divide, right? But they're connected in the sense that they are interdependent. Very much the kings uh, depend on the parks for wages, for to give them a job. And the parks are parasite, are the true parasite on the king's actual labor. Uh, without the kings, the parks kind of function, but the kings can absolutely function without the park. They just need their money. Right. They just need their money. Uh, but the value that they create, uh, it's material, the kings in this case, compared to the parks, right? And then this speaks to this social pecking order, this neo-feudalist order that this late stage of, 
uh, of capitalism that neoliberal state has created, in which the promise of social mobility coexists with the violence that involves trying, attempting to achieve that social mobility. And I'm gonna skip here um, um, Wendy Brown, because she speaks basically uh, about the same things that I've just talked, but you can have a, have a watch. Um, and, and education in the film, uh, in very implicit ways, uh, is portrayed at that, as that social mobility ladder, at that trigger that can allow the kings to rise up, uh, especially Kevin. Uh, in this case, Kevin, uh, as, as the uh, as the older son, as the paradigm paradigmatic uh, breadwinner, in of of uh, uh, it's it's the metaphor of the breadwinner, right? Like the 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 son of the family who will who will help the family to get out of poverty, right? In this very traditional sense of of a patriarchal family, right? Uh, that again evokes the same kind of social pecking order of capitalism, right? And, and that's why both Min and Kevin, even though they come from completely different background, they see uh, the, the Kim's daughter as their ticket uh, out of, uh, the ticket in, this, in the case of Kevin out of poverty, in the case of Min, the ticket for a match to, in the, to his entrance in, in the lead. And that involves going to university. She has to get into university. And university here is that type of, um, is that the symbol of, uh, of achieving uh, social mobility. And when Wendy Brown, and um, here it's, it's probably worth um, playing Wendy Brown's excerpt on education. And the problem with um, thinking of education uh, as, as, as basically mm, not a means to an end. Um, uh, there, there is there is a problem with that, um, and and I'll say that in, I'll say more in a second. One thing it's done, of course, is make education increasingly contoured toward the question of return on investment. That is, very few students of working class or let alone poor or even middle class means can look at a college education as we did in my time, your time, as something that has to do with expanding your capacities as a human being and your capacities as a citizen. Instead, the question is, how much money do you put in for how much you will get out as a potentially higher earner at the other end? So that, the problem with that is that it implies that some in some of the time, working class students, poor students, were not looking at university as a way to, um, to get a job, as a way to improve their economic lives. They were looking at university, and if you look historically at the historical record, um, and um, McClanahan does that in, in her article, uh, you realize that not only that was the case in the 50s and the 40s and the 60s in the US, but that is a case globally, that working class poor students are looking at university to get out of the social pecking order, to at least have a chance to get out of the social pecking order. The problem is that it's not so much that the university has adopted this neoliberal consensus in which um, everything becomes economized, commodified, and the university is bought in, and the students are buying in, is that capital is changing the needs for these uh, students uh, in the sense that now, while well, before having a college degree will give you a job because there was less students in colleges. Now there are more students in colleges and the competition is much more brutal. Therefore, a specialization is the requirement. Therefore, just having a college degree uh, and majoring in English is just not enough to get a good job. 
Now you have to measure in one of those degrees that will give you a return on investment, right? Um, in other words, the problem is not university, the problem is capital, right? The changes that we're seeing at university and the changes um, that uh, people like Kevin understands and has is not changes that Kevin in Parasite has internalized and now all of a sudden he's using university as a mean to an end is that people like his friend Min now are competing with Kevin. And now people like Min, uh, his more, his wealthier friend um, can see uh, the very ugly side of capitalism, the ugly side and the, and the violence of capitalist competition, because the violence of capitalist competition has to do with having a decent or not having a decent life, of living in a semi semi basement, even in a basement that gets flooded, that gets fumigated uh, in unsanitary conditions, uh, or living in a house like the parks, um, in a decent house, right? Um, so as McClanahan here. Um, uh, argues, um, uh, she suggests that for at least the last 60 years in university, the university has been tasked with training future workers. So that's always been the case, right? According to the changing needs of capital. Then what has changed is that not so much the soul of the university, this university of the mind, it's always been the same, but rather the needs of capital, which appears today, and this is key, to barely require workers at all. Because capital, the problem with capital these days is that it doesn't really require workers. There are surplus of workers that are simply not needed and they can be annihilated. Therefore, violence in capitalism and in competition gets exacerbated. Um, and this brings about despair because these people are just excess, they're surplus. Yeah. Um, Therefore, we come to uh, the very end uh, of the movie, and then we can see how social mobility, in this case, in the example of education for the kings, is not only false, but inherently violent. There is the false promise of social mobility um, is not needed because to keep the capitalist religion going, it is a symptom of the capitalist system spiraling out of control because the promise of social mobility, mobility is false, not because it was false, but because it's not working any longer because there are too many workers that are simply not necessary, that are surplus, that are an excess for the system. And this can be seen in the ending of Parasite and quiet epilogue. After awakening from a coma, Guyu realizes that his father has gone into hiding in the bunker and is effectively stuck there now that a new family has moved in. Throughout the film, Guyu and his family were motivated by what Bong called a weird mixture of hope and fear that you can fall even lower. That fear was validated halfway through the film with the introduction of this secret stairway leading down and down. And it's fully confirmed for us by the end, when Gitek essentially takes Gunse's place underground. What about vertical movement in the opposite direction? In a letter to his dad, Giyu vows to work every day until he can afford to buy the mansion. Then he writes, all you'll need to do is walk up the stairs. This devastating line sums up the myth of social mobility for the poor. Yet even as Giyu fantasizes about reaching higher ground, Bong won't let us entertain any such illusions. The camera tracks down to show Giyu back in the semi-basement where he and his family started off. The director described this shot as a surefire kill. If an audience member was still clinging to any false hope about Giyu's fate, this final shot would wipe that out once and for all. The credits roll to a song called Soju One Glass that's performed by Che U Sheik, the actor who plays Giyu. 
The lyrics, written by Bong, explain how Giyu spends the rest of his days trying to earn the money. The song's original title was 564 years, because that's how long it would realistically take Giyu to save up for a house like that. Bong said he did this cruel calculation to express his fear that the status quo he critiques in Parasite won't improve in his or his son's lifetime. Okay, so really to end um, this lecture, really the lesson, the parable that we can get from Parasite about the logic of neoliberalism, about uh, our, um, our position as global neoliberal subjects, is the intrinsic cruelty and violence that is embedded. That's why it's intrinsic, right? The intrinsic cruelty of violence that is embedded in the logic of late capitalism, precisely because the problem with late capitalism is that it, not, it doesn't need a great part of the global population. And that is really the parable uh, of, of Parasite. These people are expendable. Okay, so here you have the questions for the tutorial. I hope you have enjoyed the lecture and the film. Um, with this, um, uh, with this 